We live in a religious world and today we're putting it to the test. To help us focus our sights, we're working our way through the monotheistic faiths, examining their answers to life's five big questions. How did I get here? Why am I here? How should I live? How should I deal with sin? And where am I going when I die? Do their answers make sense internally and externally? Two simple questions, that's it. These two questions are key to considering if any religion is worth your faith. Judaism failed, stumbling under the weight of its own internal contradictions. So, our march through the monotheistic faiths continue as we look at Islam's answers to life's five big questions to see if they hold up internally and externally. Muslims also believe in a similar creation story of that of Jews as well as Christians. So they believe that there is a God who creates the universe ex nihilo, out of nothing. Do you think that makes sense? That everything spawns out of nothing? Maybe God created the Big Bang and it just took him a little while. Because I'm a Christian, I believe that he did create everything out of nothing. This is internally consistent with Islam. If you study the authoritative sources in Islam. And I would also argue that it is also externally consistent. Because again, when you look at modern cosmology, there must be some kind of uncreated creator, a first cause to start the universe into existence. What does the Quran teach about the purpose of human life? Do you have any idea? I've definitely learned this. The purpose or the reason why we are here is to submit to Allah and to give glory to Him. That would be certainly internally consistent because this is what the Quran specifically teaches. And I would argue it's also externally consistent to a degree because it seems to resonate with our deepest intuitions that if there is a God who's made us, then He is deserving of our allegiance, of our worship. Muslims have three sources of authority that guide how they should live. The first is the Quran, which they believe is the literal words of Allah. The second document, and that's known as the Hadith. In the Hadith literature are simply written traditions of what Muhammad said or approved of. And then a third document is called the Sunnah. And the Sunnah is the life example of Muhammad. What does the Quran teach about like how people should live? I'm not exactly sure. I don't, but um, I would assume it's kind of just, you know, be good. Kind of, yeah, that's yeah. kind of what the next question is. They believe in these five pillars. Right. Do you know anything about those? Not personally, no, I don't know. So the five pillars of Islam are required behaviors that are obligatory on all Muslims. The first is reciting the creed. The creed is there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. The second would be a daily prayer. A third would be the fast of Ramadan. The fourth would be a charitable giving. And the fifth pillar is the Hajj, which is a requirement that every Muslim must at least once in their lifetime, travel to Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia, and for a period of about a week and a half or so, perform a number of different rituals. Is this standard of morality internally and externally consistent? The standard for Muslims to follow the Quran, the Hadith, and the model of Muhammad is an incredible standard. There are so many commands and dictates in the Hadith that would be impossible to try to meet all of these. It, it's literally impossible. Nobody can achieve it. So in that sense, it's gonna leave everybody unfulfilled and unsatisfied because it's just an impossible system. Is it externally consistent? I have grave concerns about that because I believe that the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah teach some things that are just immoral on their face. For example, Islam has a degrading view of women. Women are um, allowed to be beaten in certain circumstances, which I think we would all agree is wrong. The Quran also identifies women's intellect as deficient. These are examples, I believe, where we have a moral standard set by Islam that is morally deficient. Muslims say that our good deeds basically outweigh or they can make up for the bad deeds that we do. Um, do you agree with that or disagree with that? You can like try and like fix yourself by doing some good stuff in life. So I think so, yeah. I don't think they can be weighed together. I don't think that it necessarily like cancels it out. Just because I do something good doesn't mean that I didn't do something bad. When you look at how sin is dealt with in the system of Islam, there doesn't seem to be a very 
clear system by which uh, a person can understand how the system works and achieve forgiveness. And so the Muslim's gonna feel constantly like they have to work harder and try more to submit to the will of Allah in order to appease this God. And that's precisely what seems to be a problem with this whole system is the lack of assurance. This is incredibly sad because in Islam, you have a meritorious based system of salvation. It's based on your deeds, on what you do. And there's no way to be guaranteed of your salvation except for fighting for the cause of Allah and Jihad and dying. It seems like the Islam system is leveraging the lack of confidence that a Muslim would have in his salvation by pressuring him to engage in a heinous act like fighting for the cause of Allah in jihad and getting himself killed. Islam talks a lot about having these scales where all your good and bad deeds are put on these scales. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you go to heaven. If your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you go to hell. However, even in that system, a lot of Muslims and Imams will say, at the end of the day though, you just have to throw yourself on the mercy of Allah. So even if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you may not make it into heaven. You can like live your whole life, kind of do the five pillars, do everything, but not be sure if you're gonna go to heaven when you die. Do you think that that's very hopeful? I don't. It really raises the question, how is this really internally consistent when you have kind of this capricious God, Allah, who can just willy-nilly decide whether you're going to heaven or hell. And so it really casts into question his goodness and his faithfulness to any kind of a system that he's even set up. Islam's answers to the five big questions fail internally and externally internal issues. Islam lays an immense moral burden on its followers. Even if you were somehow able to attain this level of moral perfection, according to the Quran, Allah can simply choose to send you to hell. So why try if Allah is going to do what he wants regardless of your actions? External issues have several deficiencies, starting with Islam's view of women. Disobedient women can be physically disciplined by their husbands or fathers. Women can be treated as property if captured in battle. And women are worth half of what a man is in terms of inheritance and standing in court. Then there's jihad. The only option to 100% guarantee a trip to heaven is to commit an act of jihad. And don't forget love and relationships. While the Quran does teach that Allah loves people, he only loves those who meet his extensive standards of righteousness. But seeing how it is impossible to achieve that standard, Allah's love is left looking quite tenuous. But let's say Allah does choose you to be in heaven. You may never see him. That's because he appears and disappears as he pleases. Unlike his creation, humankind, Allah is not relational. Which raises another important question. If Allah is not relational, why is community such an integral part of the human experience? Internally and externally, does Islam sound like a reliable system? Mm -hmm.